The crowd could tell from Jesus' face that as he locked on the eyes of that widow, he had passion. When was the last time that you looked at someone with eyes of compassion? When was the last time you had the opportunity to feel compassion in your heart? We are in this new series today uh, called The Heart of Christ, and it is about the emotions and desires and affections of Jesus. If you know someone's heart, you know them. Uh, We're more than just creatures that think. The heart is really the the core of our emotions. It's the, the center of our will. It's really who we are, our desires and our affections and our emotions all come from our heart. And you'll, you'll know that last week we really studied and celebrated what Jesus did, his actions. We st- celebrated what he did on the cross on our behalf and him overcoming death so that we could have new life. And, and that's what he did. That's called Christ's finished work. And he accomplished that on the cross for us. Um, but just because we know what he did doesn't mean we know his heart doesn't mean we know his deepest desires and affections and emotions. So picking back off of Easter week, we want to get to know Jesus' heart. We want to get to know what he is about. And the interesting thing about Scripture is that all throughout Scripture, uh, really, we see different views into the heart of Jesus. Scripture is full of different, of different uh, Scriptures that talk about his heart. For instance, the one we talked about today, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. There's a great book written by Dane Ortland that just came out last year called Gentle and Lowly. It's a fantastic book on Christ's heart for us. Then look at this one, Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy that lay before him, the joy, the joy that he had in his heart, he endured the cross. Powerful to think about Christ having a great joy in going to the cross for us. But there's more. Uh, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Jesus' heart is sympathetic for believers who are weak. That's what the writer of Hebrew tells us. And then this one's interesting. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. Often when we think of the fear of the Lord, it doesn't bring delight to our heart, and yet Jesus, it does. We're going to explore that one coming up. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, Hebrews 5, chapter 2. The Hebrews author put it kind of uh, gently, but basically what he's saying is when people are stupid and people are foolish, Jesus is able to deal gently because he has a gentle heart. We've got a couple more. Here's one from John 11 where it just says, Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Deeply moved in his heart and troubled in the core of who he was. John eleven thirty three, And then this one in Matthew 14, 14. He saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them. He saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them. But that's actually what we're going to talk about today from a different passage. We're going to talk about the heart of Christ and how Jesus has a heart full of of compassion. If you've got a Bible, you can open up to Luke 7, verse 11 through 17, and we will get into God's Word. This is a story about Jesus performing a miracle for someone who was in a broken situation and hopeless. It's called the story of the widow of Nain. Afterward, Jesus was on his way to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large large crowd were traveling with him. Just as he neared the gate of the town, a dead man was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. The large crowd from the city was also with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Don't weep. Then he came up and touched the open coffin, and the pallbearers stopped, and he said, Young man, I tell you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. 
Then fear came over everyone, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him, Jesus, went throughout Judea and all the vicinity. Amen. Lord, we pray that you would be with us this morning in the preaching of your word. We pray that you would um, give us deeper hearts of compassion and help us to see your heart full of compassion. And all God's people said, When was the last time that you looked at somebody with a heart full of compassion? When was the last time that you felt compassion in your heart as you saw someone in a broken situation or a hopeless situation? Yesterday morning, I went out for a walk, and I was walking uh, north on Dixie Highway, just north of Pembroke Road, right by that dog park that's over there in the Brazilian Steakhouse. And it was early in the morning, and I was walking And as I was walking and got next to the dog park there on Dixie Highway, I heard this screech, like the sound of a crime being committed or something, someone hollering. I won't do it for you now because I'd blow your ears out, but it got my attention because it sounded like something crazy was happening. Someone was screaming at the top of their lungs. Well, as I'm walking, I look over in the dog park and there's uh, uh, three people walking towards me and they kind of turn around and look ahead or look back to the sound, wondering what it was as well. And so I look at them as they're coming towards me, and I say, what was that? And they say, I don't know. I said, well, I head that way. I guess I'll find out. And they said, be careful. And I said, I will. So I continue to walk forward down Dixie Highway, and I look across the street near the train tracks, and there is this guy who's walking kind of funny as he crosses the street. And as soon as I see him, I just know, I know that this guy is, like, high on something, like, it's 7 in the morning. He's probably been up all night. He's, he's high on something. And, and I decide, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to continue to walk towards him and, and, and probably just say hi or something like that um, until he got on the sidewalk and turned towards me. And as he turned towards me and looked at me about 20 yards away, probably from about me to Jessica, he did this. And at that moment, as I was heading towards him, I just kind of walked out into the road in Dixie Highway just to pass him by. You know, as I, as I thought about it, I was like, what could be a, a, an act of compassion? Um, well, there's COVID going on right now, and you don't really get up in people's faces and talk to them. I didn't have my wallet on me, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really buy him anything. And, you know, I've had conversations like this before, and you just know that someone's not going to remember what you say to them 12 hours later. And so I didn't really feel bad about not having an option to show him compassion. I kind of knew there was nothing that I could really do. But as I walked by him, I felt a deep conviction. And the the reason that I found this conviction was because I decided not to make eye contact with him. Because you know if you make eye contact with someone, all of a sudden there's something that happens and you're sort of sucked into whatever problem they had. And so I just looked down at the ground and I kept walking. And as soon as he passed me, I just felt this conviction that that was the wrong thing to do. That, that like, there was no compassion in my response. When was the last time that you looked at someone with eyes of compassion? When was the last time you had the opportunity to feel compassion in your heart? Right now, we're in an interesting time in our culture because there are so many opportunities to show people compassion. There's so many people that are hurting, that are struggling to pay bills, that have buried loved ones, that are sick themselves. There's needs for compassion everywhere we look. And yet at the same time, it's hard to show compassion right now Because everybody needs compassion. Everybody needs compassion. We're all going through our stuff. And at at times, I just find it's overwhelming. I mean, even this week, I I have friends that are living in Burma right now, and that country's kind of falling apart. And we had family friends that uh, someone was really sick with COVID and just sort of feel helpless and overwhelmed. Like, what am I supposed to do that can actually make a difference? I don't even have the compassion to care about all these situations. Are you feeling compassion fatigue as you look around and you see all the different needs that we have in our city and in our country and around the world? You might be feeling compassion fatigue yourself 
Because you want someone to show you compassion. I'm sure as you look around and you say, I want to help someone, I want to look at, I want to look at people with eyes full of compassion, you yourself might struggle because you're like, I just want someone to show compassion to me. I just want someone to get the situation I am and just look at me with a heart full of compassion. See, we want to have hearts that are full of compassion for others. We want others to look at us with hearts full of compassion. We want to see others with hearts full of compassion. We want to offer compassion. But we're often overwhelmed by others' needs and our own needs. And so rather than having hearts full of compassion, if we're honest, our hearts are just tired. Our hearts are just tired and empty. Well, the good news today is this simple truth. Jesus' heart is full of compassion. We can admit our low compassion. We can admit that our hearts run dry of compassion. We can admit the brokenness that we live in and that we see in our world because Jesus' heart is full of compassion. And as he sees your brokenness, and as he sees the brokenness in our world, and as he sees the brokenness in this city, and as he sees everything in the whole entire world that's messed up and broken, he does not run out of compassion. Jesus' heart is full of compassion. Let me show you from our text. In verse 11, it tells us that Jesus was traveling with quite an entourage towards the city of Nain. By this time, Luke tells us that He's become quite a big deal. He's performed miracles. There are people that are following him. And so when, when Luke uses this word, large crowd, we're meant to believe that it's probably a, like, at least 1,000 people, up to 5,000 people that are with him. This is an entourage that Jesus has with him. And he's traveling from west to east towards the little village of Nain. But as he and this group of thousands of people are traveling towards the city of Nain, they come across another group of people, probably much smaller. The word that Luke uses makes us think that this group isn't in the thousands, it's probably more in the hundreds. So we have a group of a thousand people or more coming with Jesus and this small little procession coming out of the city of Nain. And it's a funeral procession. It's a procession where someone has passed away and they are going out of the city to bury him. Let me get this fixed. Now, in our culture, there's different ways that funerals can go down. Some of you come from cultures where funerals are really loud, and some of you come from, fun from places where funerals are really quiet. Uh, some of you come from places where funerals are swift and orderly, and some of you come from cultures where funerals drag out over a long period of time and they're very fluid. Uh, this funeral is different than all of those. This, this, a funeral in the ancient Near East started with the women leading the funeral procession. And the women would lead the people out of the city in this march to bury this person who had died. And behind the women would be the casket. And the casket was different than a casket that we would have. The casket was more like a wicker bed with the body just laying on top for all to see. There wasn't anything that would close on top of it, so everyone could see the body laying on this wicker bed as pallbearers carried the body behind the women. But then behind, uh, behind the pallbearers, behind the casket, there would be a group of professional mourners. In other words, these group of people would be hired to weep and wail publicly to set the tone for the funeral. So as they marched out, this group of people would, would cry out things like, come weep with this family if you have a bitter heart. Come weep with this family if you have a bitter heart. People would cry that out, these professional mourners, and they would also play the flutes, like play a dirge, to set the tone for the funeral. Then behind the mourners would be the crowd of people from the village. And as we said, Nain is a little town, so it was probably just a couple hundred people. Now, Luke just mentions all this real quickly. I'm really thankful for an author named Paul Miller who helped bring this funeral to life for me. But what Luke describes in detail is that this funeral is for the son of a widow. 
In other words, this is the son of someone who has already lost their husband. In this culture, if a woman was to lose her husband, her hope of economic stability just went down the tubes. Uh, she couldn't go back to school to get a job. Uh, women were dependent on their husbands or their families to provide for them, unless you had a son. Unless you had a son, if your husband dies and you have a son, then your son can, can grow into the family business or can find a way to support you as his mother. But Luke's careful to tell us that this is the widow's only son. So not only has she lost her husband, but now she's lost her only son. And therefore, it's not just her family that she's lost. Rather, it's all hope of economic stability. She is not only heading to a grave, she is heading towards a life of financial ruin and poverty. I wonder what it was like to be her in that moment. I bet she felt quite hopeless. You see, in those times, funerals weren't days or weeks after the person died. Sometimes they were the same day. So this death is fresh. Someone might die overnight or die in the morning, and by the end of the day, they would be buried. Her life has completely changed in 24 hours, and she is now in a place with no hope as she heads to that grave. I wonder what it was like to see her. I wonder if she was silent. I wonder if she was wailing. I wonder if she was looking up with open arms, asking God why. I wonder what it was like to see her. But Luke tells us this, Jesus did see her. In verse 13, he says, the Lord saw her. That the Lord saw her. And as he sees her, as he sees this one woman in the midst of a group of a hundred, in the, in the midst of a group of a thousand, he sees her. And as he sees her, as his eyes lock on her, what does it say? He had compassion. His heart went out to her. Something happened in Jesus' heart that he was drawn to her to do something for her, to step into her broken situation, to enter into her hopelessness and show compassion. Now, Paul Miller also points out that Luke is uh, written, the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, is written by Luke compiling eyewitness testimonies. That's what he says in chapter 1. So Luke probably didn't actually witness the scene. He talked to those who did witness the scene. And if you think about it, it'd be interesting to have seen Jesus, to have seen this verse take place. Because if you're in the midst of a crowd of thousands of people or hundreds of people, it's hard to know who Jesus would be looking at unless he's looking at them, unless he's staring at them in such an intense way that everyone else around realizes who his eyes are locked on. And not only that, you can tell from my face that I'm angry right now. You can tell from my face that I'm surprised right now. The crowd could tell from Jesus' face that as he locked onto the eyes of that widow, he had compassion brewing in his heart. Jesus' heart is full of compassion. And so what does he do? He goes up to the woman and he speaks to her. And he says, don't weep. kind of an insensitive thing to say if you think about it. When someone has just lost their only means of economic stability, they've lost their family. You know, if my kid falls down and they're screaming because they've really hurt themselves, and I say, don't cry, it's a little bit insensitive of me. Unless I can actually do something to fix it. Unless Jesus can do something to fix it. Jesus sees her. He feels something deep in her heart, in his heart, and now he's about to act. See, his compassion isn't just an empathy that's powerless. His empathy is something that draws him to act. What he feels deeply in his heart causes him to act powerfully with his hands. So what does he do in verse 14? Then he, Jesus, came up and touched the open coffin, and the pallbearers stopped. Now, what's interesting about him even touching the coffin was that rabbis and priests in that day, if they were to touch a dead body, 
it would make them ceremonially unclean. So they would be out of a job for seven days while they self-quarantined and went through ritual sacrifices in order to purify themselves before God and before the before their community because death had infected them. But Jesus, he doesn't seem to be concerned about it getting, getting infected with death. It's because he's about to infect death with life. And notice how subtle he is. He goes up, he stopped the funeral. He goes up, and he doesn't say, everybody gather around, let me show you something. No, he just goes up and he says, young man, I tell you, get up. Young man, I tell you, get up. We see that Jesus' compassion is coupled with real power. His compassion is not a sentimentality that causes him just to feel something in his heart that he can't do anything about. Young man, I tell you to get up. And the young man does in verse 15. The dead man sat up and began to speak. Now, what an opportunity for Jesus. I mean, he's literally got thousands of people around. This would be an awesome opportunity to call people into discipleship, which is good, to explain who he more is as the Messiah. But he doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't see this as an opportunity to grow his fame, although it wouldn't be wrong if he did, because his heart is still beating with compassion for that widow. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Who was he focused on the entire time? His heart full of compassion from beginning to the end is focused on that widow. He has a deep desire to step into her brokenness with his power and compassion. You know, sometimes Jesus will do miracles and either require faith to do the miracle or acts for faith as a response to the miracle. In fact, the story about the centurion in Luke 7 comes right before that, and that's exactly what that story is about. But this story, Jesus just acts with compassion. He sees a woman who's in a broken situation who has no other hope, and his heart goes out to her because his heart is just full of compassion for her. Jesus' heart is full of compassion, and it never runs dry. What, what can you and I learn from that? What can you and I learn as we look at Jesus' heart full of compassion? Well, we can learn how to grow in acts of compassion ourselves. I mean, there's something really beautiful about this, how as Jesus just sees one person. He sees one person and he stops long enough to let his heart go out to her. And then as he as he go as it goes out to her, he's willing to change his plans, right? He's willing to slow down his entourage so that as he sees this woman and his heart goes out to her, he can act. He can do something about it. If we want to grow in acts of compassion, we've got to be willing to look at people. We've got to be willing to enter into their pain. We've got to be willing to let our hearts brew with compassion and act to give them hope, to fix the brokenness, to heal and restore. But also, not to make it about us. You know, you know I, I, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, how often do we as a culture like do good for other people that restores them, that heals them, that brings good into their life, and then we're like, fix somebody's situation, you know? How often do we post things on social media to be celebrated for our acts of compassion? Not necessarily wrong, yet here's Jesus focused from beginning to end on this one not there to celebrate, doesn't even care if the crowd gets right who he actually is. He just wants to show this 
woman compassion. And as we look at Jesus, we see not only does he see her, not only does his heart go out to her, not only is he willing to let her disrupt his plans, but it's all about her from beginning to the end. Maybe that will help us grow in acts of compassion with these practical steps that Jesus actually carries out. But maybe we can even begin to imagine, with a holy imagination, what it would be like if Jesus encountered the people in our paths, the people who might get in our way, the people whose brokenness might seem too big to fix. What would it be like if Jesus encountered those people? And maybe as we begin to think about that, it might inspire us to show acts of compassion to people in broken situations. By the power of the Holy Spirit in us, Jesus working grace through us as we imagine the compassion of Jesus at work in our lives. We can grow in acts of compassion. But but also this, I think one thing we can learn is that we can grow in an understanding of God's compassion. God's compassion. There is this belief that the God of the Old Testament was compassionless, And that Jesus in the New Testament is full of compassion. That's a popular belief, and I can understand why. As you read some of the passages in the Old Testament, it does seem like God is compassionless, but he's not. You know, in God's compassion, he chose Israel to be his beloved family. And in his compassion, he saved them from slavery And in his compassion, he called them to himself and said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And in his compassion, he gave them his law. And in his compassion, he forgave them over and over and over again. In his compassion, even though they were faithless, he was faithful. And in his compassion, he required that his people be compassionate. Over and over in the, in the Old Testament, it says that God is a God of compassion and requires his people to be people of compassion, to show compassion to the widow, the orphan, the sojourner, and the poor. Over and over, we're given these examples throughout the Old Testament that God is not a God of no compassion, but a God who is also full of a heart of compassion. And as we come to the New Testament, we have to realize this. Jesus is full of compassion, but his compassion isn't spineless. His compassion isn't squishy so that we can do whatever we want with it. Rather, his compassion is all about gathering us to himself. In Luke 13, Jesus looks over at Jerusalem and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Do you hear the compassion in Jesus' voice for broken sinners and rebels in the holy city of God? And yet, at the very same time, it's not, hey, do whatever you want with my compassion. It's, my compassion is here to draw you to myself. My compassion is here to draw you to me. My compassion is here because I'm going to save you from your sins. Repent and believe and come to me, the compassionate Lord and Savior. So as you look at Jesus, do you see his compassion? Do you see that he sees you and has compassion? He sees the people in your life that need healing and restoration, and he has compassion. He sees the brokenness in our city, every broken situation, and he has compassion. He sees Burma. He sees what's happening in different parts of the world. He sees those countries that don't have any vaccines yet, and he has compassion. Do you see his compassion? Do you see that he has compassion. But what's most profound is not that we see his compassion, but that he sees our sinfulness and still has compassion on sinners and rebels like us. That in God's great compassion, the Son of God was sent for sinners who were shaking their fists at God. And Jesus came as an act of compassion 
die on the cross for our sins. Don't miss that today. The people in the story missed it. And in the verse 16, it says that they said a great prophet has come. God has done something in this act of power and compassion for this woman. But they missed the fact he wasn't just a prophet. He was a savior. He was a Lord. He was a great king who had come to die on the cross to show God's compassion. Here's the most profound thing about Jesus' heart full of compassion. Jesus sees our sin. He sees our rebellion. He sees who we really are. He doesn't look away. He doesn't hide his eyes. He moves towards us with compassion, giving his life for us that we might be gathered to him and know his compassion. 